the side of a country road in Sweden stands the Borgsta runestone. With the central fragment only recently discovered, it depicts a figure on horseback hunting a deer, assisted by two birds and two dogs. The figure is widely believed to represent the Norse god Odin, accompanied by his two wolves and two ravens, and places their association in Western culture as far back as the 11th century. Now, almost a thousand years on, we're still gaining new insights into the complex relationship between the wolf and the raven. Nature is full of interactions between living organisms, termed ecological relationships. One of the most well known is predation, such as the wolves chasing the deer on the Borgsta runestone. However, the relationship between Canis lupus and Corvus corax isn't quite as easy to identify. In fact, there's three different types of relationship that could be applied here. There's competition, or conflict over a resource, commensalism, where one organism benefits with no effect on the other and mutualism, in which both species benefit from the interaction. Before we go into more detail, it's important to remember that as humans we have a habit of romanticising the natural world, that is, we tend to apply unrealistic ideas to describe how animals interact. We've done this for many thousands of years, with the wolf and raven themselves featuring in variants of Native American and Inuit creation myths. Though we habitually portray animals as more human, it's important to remember that they are not, and we can't simply attribute behaviours we observe in the wild to other species thinking like we do. So given that, what does the evidence point to? From observation and long-term study, we know that where wolves thrive, so do ravens, and that to an extent, the raven population depends on wolves providing a food source in order to remain stable. When wolves kill their prey, ravens will flock to the carcass and, once it's been opened for them, will each remove up to two pounds, or just under one kilogram of meat per day. For a small pack, that's up to 75% of the kill. Clearly, this is of huge benefit to the ravens, but how does it affect the wolves? Studies to determine this have been conducted in the US and Canada, including Eel Royale, an island in Lake Superior and the site of wolf monitoring since 1958. The results were pretty unexpected. It turned out that although single wolves have the capacity to bring down large prey on their own, the amount of meat removed from the kill by ravens makes this very inefficient. By hunting in packs, there is less opportunity for scavengers and more food for pack members, albeit in smaller portions. In short, wolves may form packs partly to avoid losing out to ravens. So if competing with ravens as a kill has a fundamental impact on wolf sociality, surely the relationship between the species is competitive. Perhaps, unsurprisingly, it's not quite that simple. Although raven scavenging may be an influence in wolf pack formation, it's not the only cause. There's enough environmental and physical factors to make another video entirely. Furthermore, a large pack would likely have the energy to prevent ravens from scavenging a kill at all, and yet still permit it. Bernd Heinrich, author of Mind of the Raven, noted how it would be very cheap for a bunch of wolves to protect their kills. So, perhaps it's more than competition. In fact, if a large pack's losses to ravens as a kill are negligible, then it's closer to being what's known as commensalism. This is where one animal gains for an interaction, at no cost to the other. Do wolves just not care enough to chase ravens from their food on a regular basis? The answer to this takes us to the last alternative, mutualism. Wolves do in fact chase ravens. However, this is rarely in defence of a kill. Instead, it appears they are playing together. Examples of games between the two species have been documented as far back as 1970 in Meech's The Wolf. The birds would dive at a wolf's head or tail, and the wolf would duck and then leap at them. Sometimes the ravens chased the wolves, flying just above their heads, and once a raven waddled to a resting wolf, pecked at its tail, and jumped aside as the wolf snapped at it. When the wolf retaliated by stalking the raven, the bird allowed it to within a foot before arising, then it landed a few feet beyond the wolf, and repeated the prank. Meech goes on to consider if each animal is rewarded in some way by the presence of the other, though he admits the speculative nature of this statement. Heinrich, who I mentioned has written several books on the birds, is even quoted as observing a raven interacting with a wolf pup, where it would gently yank its tail. If this is accurate, a huge degree of trust between the two species is implied. 
From this, it appears that wolves not only tolerate ravens, but encourage their company. Yet, trying to establish where the wolves are benefiting is not easy. In fact, the best answers are still only theoretical, such as Heinrich's view. Wolves may respond to certain raven vocalizations or behavior that indicate prey. At a kill site, the birds are more suspicious and alert than wolves. The birds serve the wolves as extra eyes and ears. More recently, in 2010, an unpublished report summarized 17 years of observations of wolf packs and ravens in Canada's Banff National Park. The research may indicate unique relationships between individual wolf packs and flocks of ravens. That is, each pack may have their own companion ravens and actively seek out one another's company. As mentioned earlier, it's important not to personify wild animals, yet what happens when the line between science and mythology becomes blurred? There's no doubt that we are only beginning to understand the full extent of this complex relationship. Perhaps, as with the Boxster runestone, the full extent of the connection between wolves and ravens will become clear when we unearth the final piece of the picture.